final day of the world's largest fintech fest, the Global Fintech Fest, organized by Fintech Convergence Council and Payments Council of India, which are a part of Internet and Mobile Association of India. The fest is presented by the National Payments Corporation of India, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, Government of India, Reserve Bank of India, and supported by Niti Aayog, Startup India, and Invest India. We would like to welcome you all for a panel discussion on developing fintech solutions across boundaries. We have a distinguished set of panelists joining us today. Please join me in welcoming the moderator, Mr. Vishal Narula, Managing Director, Alvarez and Marcel, followed by our panelists, Mr. Ritesh Shula, Chief Executive Officer at National Payments at NPCI, Mr. Kagiso Motibi, Head FinTech and Innovation Hub Financial Sector Conduct Authority, and Ms. Susan Hannestad, Chief Executive Officer at FinTech Mundi. A very warm welcome to Mr. Narula. Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this session. I am privileged to be uh, moderating this session in the midst of such stalwarts from the industry, from different walks, and you just heard their introductions. I think we have a lot to learn and we have a lot to ponder upon during this session. What we wish to do is to be able to help everyone understand the scope and the opportunity that exists with cross-border fintech solutions and how they will not just disrupt uh, the world and uh, the economies, they will actually help us create a level of inclusion and uniformity that we may have never thought about before. But just to set some kind of a context with, uh, you know, for you and especially for those of us who are in India at this point of time, I think the first instance of us really brushing ourselves with FinTech came in November 2016 when we went through a demonetization process. Yeah, and it was way, way before uh, COVID hit us. And by the time COVID hit us, things were rather easy for us to be able to transact because we had already adopted FinTech in our individual lives. And not just that, I think businesses had also adopted FinTech in a way that they never thought would be existing before. And coming from an advisory background, I can tell you when we speak to clients and when we talk to them about uh, transformation, especially in finance, it is uh, technology in finance, in carrying out transactions, in being able to recording transactions, in being able to meet regulatory requirements becomes absolutely easy when we use a variety of different solutions that get integrated with the businesses. Now extrapolate this beyond borders and assume that you have large conglomerates who are able to use similar technology platforms across borders seamlessly. And just to take it at a level of a totally different disruption, think about it at a user level. If users are able to just transfer money, which has recently become a reality between India and Singapore, freely just using your mobile apps, what would happen? And as many research reports as I read over this, I think there is a very clear and direct correlation between um, uh, the adoption of fintech at a user level the GDP of a country and they both support each other. So countries with larger GDPs have a much higher adoption of fintech, but countries who are developing and have recently started adopting uh, finance technology in uh, their day-to-day -day lives are showing massive amounts of growth. And India is the second highest in terms of uh, revenues when one looks at fintech today. Uh, I think five years back in 2016, we weren't there and the kind of growth that we have seen is thanks to technology and especially thanks to the kind of payments infrastructure that has been created in India thanks to NPCI, right? Over the next few minutes, we will dive into um, uh, the, land, uh, the landscape of payments across the world, dive into some specific uh, case studies uh, about how India has transformed and taking it globally what the regulators across the world can do and are facing as challenges and finally end with what each one of us thinks is going to be the key difference of using fintech in our lives so here i'd like to start by asking suzanne uh, with respect to uh, if you can share with us where are we moving globally in terms of fintech and adoption of fintech how is it helping us 
are we there is there a long way to go and who's doing what so over to you suzanne thank you visal and uh, thank you for being part of uh, this uh, fantastic uh, event um, we in FinTech uh, Mundi, we are based uh, here in the Nordic in, in Europe. Uh, we work very closely with uh, Findexable. And I'm gonna, the last uh, report uh, they have uh, on the ranking of the countries, uh, the ranking of cities uh, throughout the world, uh, and just give you a flavor of uh, what's going on uh, there. Um, U, uh, US is at the top. Uh, they have been number one, and UK is number two. Those two have been there up, uh, for a long, long, long time. What we see, though, is that uh, Asia Pacific is uh, coming in. Uh, Singapore is doing uh, great. Uh, Australia is uh, doing great. And then we have the Nordic uh, countries. Uh, they are uh, among the top, with Sweden, Lithuania, Estonia, Finland, and Denmark uh, among the uh, top uh, 20. India is 23, and climbing. So uh, what you said, uh, Vizal, that uh, a lot is uh, happening. Uh, uh, and we know it's a lot of uh, uh, development in India. Looking at uh, cities, uh, and here we will have a few of, few of the, uh, the Indian cities uh, coming up. San Francisco, London are top uh, one and two. Uh, Sao Paulo, uh, Latin America is uh, number four. And then number 10 is uh, Singapore. And then we have on the number 13, we have uh, New Delhi. And on the <clears throat> 20th, we have Bangalore. And then on uh, 23, we have Mumbai. So uh, India is very well represented uh, there. And again, the Nordics, they are among the, the top 20 city, 25 cities as well, with uh, uh, Stockholm on the 14th. So that gives a flavor of a good mix between uh, the various uh, continents. Just looking at uh, the European, uh, Stockholm is on uh, 14, we have Vilnius of, uh, on 11, and, and so forth we go down. So the Nordics, of course, is uh, coming and have been leading for quite some, some time. Another uh, index I would like you to uh, get yourself uh, familiar with is the, the Global Innovation Index. That's an annual uh, annual thing. And on top is uh, Switzerland. Uh, number two is uh, Sweden. Uh, we have uh, Korea, the Republic of Korea on number five, uh, Finland on seven, and Denmark nine. So that also gives you a, a flavor. And I assume uh, India is uh, climbing that <laughs> ladder quite dramatically. Uh, with everything that is uh, happening uh, when it comes to um, uh, real-time payment and, and so forth. We are into uh, financial inclusion and uh, we work with uh, MasterCard uh, uh, with that uh, summit and uh, we made a report uh, there and again uh, Findexable was a part uh, of that uh, report uh, and what we see that uh, is uh, uh, the promotion of collaboration is, is a key thing to our, our cross government's development agency and the private sector and the innovators ending the exclusive uh, the exclusion for, for good. And then my main insight, uh, we saw that is, uh, of course, the new mobile money uh, proposition has the potential to reduce the world's unbanked uh, population by more than a third. Just giving you uh, one company coming out of Sweden. French Fish, uh, they offer offline uh, solutions, uh, payment solutions, and I, I know they are in, in various places in India as we speak. Then we have another uh, radar that I want you to look into, uh, and that is uh, the diversity radar, the fintech diversity radar. That is being worked on as we speak, and a lot of insight and uh, surveys have been done over the last uh, year, and it will be launched in, in the beginning of uh, uh, November. And here, uh, if you see at the percentage of women that is uh, uh, being a founder or, or a, a CEO or both, uh, Africa and uh, Asia P Pacific is in fact leading in the world. They have 7.5%, uh, which I think is, is a good one. And Europe is number three with uh, 6.9. Something to bear in mind uh, going forward uh, that we'd always think that uh, the Western society is uh, doing uh, what they uh, think to. So that was my uh, start, uh, uh, Visal, and uh, of course, uh, a lot of other discussions we can continue with. So that's uh, very insightful, and it's very good to see that you have we have um, at least three of the main Indian cities uh, quite high up there uh, in the index, as you mentioned. You know, not too far behind Singapore as such. But uh, um, so, so are we then summarizing that the world is moving towards adoption of fintech very rapidly, and 
and how are how are different countries doing on the outbound side do you see all of these developed countries who are high up in the index going beyond their borders or do you see more developing countries going beyond the borders and of course i'd really love to know how india is doing in that <laughs> Uh, what we see though is uh, in Europe uh, with uh, the harmonization of regulation and regulation is a big uh, stakeholder uh, when we're talking financial service and, and uh, fintech. So uh, Europe is, is doing quite a lot uh, and mentioning this uh, crunch rich and open banking companies that is here in, in uh, Europe like Neonomics. They are looking uh, first Europe and then going uh, towards uh, Asia and, and Singapore is a good, uh, good hub to that. Another uh, aspect is that uh, from the Nordics, there, there's uh, close to 100 companies that are present uh, in uh, emerging market, meaning uh, Africa, Southeast Asia and Latin America. And we see that. Uh, of course, we see the American companies coming out of California. They, of course, are, are uh, once they've done it in, in California, they go global. So they will be present uh, all over the world uh, as soon as uh, they see opportunities. And in this sense, uh, with the, the large population in India, the Indian market is very uh, tempting for all these uh, continents uh, to be part of. So uh, here we are. <laughs> so I think uh, with that, uh, I'd like to bring in Ritesh. Uh, Ritesh is the CEO of NPCI International Payments Limited. And he's the person who has taken India's indigenous payments infrastructure beyond India's boundaries. And here, Ritesh, I'd like to, you know, ask you if you could tell us uh, how much has changed with respect to financial inclusion with the introduction of UPI in India and what are the learnings that you are using that allows you to take it outside the boundaries of India so easily and, and so rapidly? Thank you, Vishal, uh, for the opportunity. Pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, when you talk of financial inclusion in India, I think the first thing that comes to your mind is UPI. And uh, UPI has uh, truly uh, transformed the uh, payment landscape in India. Uh, it actually reflects in the volumes that um, have, are being processed or have been processed on the platform. Uh, in 2020, uh, we processed uh, volumes worth 457 billion US dollars on the UPI platform. And uh, this is, you know, estimated to be roughly around 15% of India's, uh, you know, GDP. Uh, now, if you compare it with, uh, you know, 2017, when the platform was launched, uh, the volumes that were processed were, were about $8 billion. And uh, with 457 billion billion in 2020, this is a compounded annual growth rate of 285% plus. And uh, this actually shows uh, what has happened. I mean, this is truly transformational and volumes continue to build. Like for the month of August, we processed about 3.55 billion financial transactions amounting to about $86 billion. Now, this is what UPI has achieved here in India uh, on the financial inclusion front. Uh, if, you, if you look at current landscape, now merchants of different sizes across rural as well as urban landscape have now digital payments as an option. So they can, you know, offer this to their consumers uh, as against cash uh, dominant society we had a few years back. So this is, this is phenomenal here. Uh, we have gone to the deep corners of the country and given merchants, consumers and options to pay digitally. Now this uh, is, uh, this, uh, I mean, FEET is a outcome of ecosystem level collaboration. Like uh, it's all actually anchored, orchestrated by NPCI, but everybody has played their role and, um, you know, the credit goes to the entire ecosystem. Uh, in terms of your question around uh, our learnings and what actually differentiates UPI from others, I think we have about uh, seven or eight things that actually differentiate UPI from um, others. One is uh, ours is an API-driven uh, platform, so it's easy to integrate. Uh, it is interoperable, uh, unlike in some other markets in the world wherein the payment works within the rails of a particular operator. No, it's truly interoperable here. Uh, you can uh, exchange uh, um, uh, money within different players in the ecosystem. It is real time. So money moves, at least for the consumer, money moves quickly. And there is, you know, confidence when you see the money in your bank account instantly. It's simplistic. It runs on aliases, uh, you know, unlike um, some of the other players who have a complicated way of, uh, you know, um, identifying customers and, you know, pushing money through. Uh, it truly operates on the open banking ethos. Like um, you can download any app from a 
Google or app, Apple Store and connect it uh, post authentication to any bank account in the country and start transacting. So it's truly interoperable. While others are not drawing rules for open banking, we already have done it here and we've been doing it since 2017. And it's uh, it, it's it can be integrated with multiple service channels, uh, mobile, internet. We also have USSD because uh, when we launched the solution, smartphone penetration in India was about 16%. Now we are touching 50% mark, but we have a USSD uh, you know, channel that works uh, to drive uh, last mile inclusion and even in the corners where there is no data connectivity. So that's there. Then we have a very, very tight governance and collaborative engagement model that actually allows, uh, you know, um, participants to drive innovation, create, uh, you know, superior user experiences, drive good UX to gain traction and, you know, be closer to the consumer. Uh, and above all, finally, you know, we are a very diverse country and uh, uh, we have a multilingual capability that actually allows uh, uh, consumers from across the country to, you know, access the platform in their own preferred language and, uh, you know, uh, imbibe on the benefit that it delivers. So I think this is this is what has happened here. And uh, we are very proud uh, of, you know, achieving this uh, in collaboration with the o- overall ecosystem. So, Ritesh, you have taken uh, UPI beyond India's borders. Um, can you share with us when you when you uh, like you put it a truly interoperable mechanism when that's taken across the borders is it easily and seamlessly integrated and adopted in different borders uh, different countries what kind of opportunities and challenges do you see there so Vishal we are trying to you know do two things here one is uh, the consumers that we have in here in India who are using UPI powered apps across the ecosystem for P2P and P2M transactions. Uh, so we are trying to expand that landscape. So for for instance, for P2M, we are trying to create acceptance across the borders of India uh, to ensure that the consumers who are using these apps here with full confidence also get the same user experience when they go overseas. So that's on the P2M side. For P2P, we are looking at you know forging network to network partnerships so that uh, the cross-border remittances um, happen the same way the domestic, you know, P2P payments happen. So we want to, you know, bring in uh, value there for our consumers on the speed, transparency, as well as the financial aspect of it. So that's, uh, you know, for expanding the current here network. But we're also equally interested in, uh, you know, uh, collaborating with the central banks, with the governments uh, in, uh, in internationally to create something like UPI and deliver same level of benefits and drive inclusion there uh, and, you know, help commerce at a grassroots level, rural, urban, different landscapes. So so these are things that we are doing uh, on the UPI um, landscape. I was about to ask you about commerce at a grassroots level. Good you touched upon it. So are we saying it will be possible for um, businessmen in India to pay uh, for whatever goods and services they import or export to other countries through a UPI network? So uh, is it going to be possible to use UPI for business transactions as well? So in the first phase, uh, I mean, uh, we are looking at more consumer transactions, but once you establish connectivity, once you you put in the rails uh, with the necessary regulatory approvals, uh, I mean, the sky is the limit. UPI is a robust and scalable platform and we are demonstrating it with the performance here. So that's uh, what I would like to say here. So on, on that note, um, you know, I would like to ask Kagiso uh, from a regulator's perspective, you know, Ritesh just mentioned it depends all upon the regulatory approvals. You have seen a real burst of uh, um, uh, fintech cross borders, and uh, being you're, you are in South Africa, being based in the African region, you have, I would have been the beneficiary of a lot of technology as well. What kind of challenges do you have you seen? Uh, uh, you know, when you get cross border uh, fintech solutions in Africa, uh, and and is it really easy or is it really difficult? be able to monitor them from a regulatory perspective so you know and i would just like to probably not ask too many questions but also as a regulator what would give you sleepless nights because of this sure um thanks for that question vishal so absolutely i think in the african context we're starting we have seen the rise of digital platforms that are looking to operate cross-border and their entire premise is really to solve for financial inclusion So across many countries in Africa, banking penetration is not that high. And so um, in order to fill this gap, we have started to see fintechs and interestingly also telcos actually 
look to address that gap in the market. And so as a result of that, we've seen the rise, a rise of um, digital platforms, fintech-based digital platforms. And um, in South Africa specifically, banking penetration, interestingly enough, is actually high. So customers have a current account that they can store funds in and transfer uh, funds to. But the issue is more around financial deepening. deepening. So beyond just having an account to be able to transact on, um, co consumers are underinsured, consumers, uh, consumers are not saving enough, and certainly... Um, consumers are also not able to access funds, particularly consumers that are non-traditional in nature. And so as a result of that, platforms have come in and, and, and looked to fill the gap, which has been very exciting because um, the fact that they're leveraging non-traditional data to understand customers in ways that um, traditional financial services providers um, don't typically engage in, that's meant more have been included. So we've actually been excited by, by this development. Um, and so, so we tend to look at this from a two-sided perspective. So on one hand, we obviously look at the benefits and we want to amplify the benefits. So as mentioned before, the financial inclusion through, through the use of non-traditional data to better understand customers, that's something that's compelling for us and we certainly want to promote. Um, the, the extent to which um, these fintechs are driving personalization through the use of data. So meaning products are better matching customer needs. That's also something we find quite compelling in many of the propositions we're seeing. And so that's also something we wanna drive. And the improvement in convenience. So obviously because of digital, the digital nature of these distribution channels means you can reach more customers. And then ultimately the use of data driving affordability. Um, so you can price better, you can price specifically, you can be more targeted. So that's the approach we take on one hand to look at it, to look at those benefits and see to what extent can those be amplified. But unfortunately, there's also some concerns, and a lot of them are contextual. So, what we often found was is that um, some at some in some cases the digital literacy levels are not sufficient to really roll out these products and obtain informed consent from customers, and. Typically, we find that um, some of the innovators, they're not really um, undertaking in fit for purpose consumer education that educates the consumers to a level where they can actually meaningfully participate in um, in, in their platforms. And given the fact that the relationship is often underpinned by the use of data, which evolves as algorithms learn more about you, that is quite a sophisticated and evolving relationship. So if the customer is unsure about how that plays out, that can also lead to problems. So we are concerned about that. Um, another issue is just around data ethics. So data really being used um, that that could potentially be used to discriminate customers or could lead to decision biases that exclude. So that's another area that um, we're looking at, particularly black box algorithms, where the fintechs themselves do not understand um, the algorithms they're running, let alone be able to control them. And um, the other part is just really around anti-competitive behavior. So once the customer has been acquired, the inability for them to switch or opt out. Um, so various propositions designed to lock in a customer and essentially prevent them from being able to enjoy alternatives. So those are just some of the concerns that we're certainly engaging platforms on um, in order for those risks to be addressed. And I think one other risk maybe also to touch on is the cross-border nature of these platforms often times means from a regulatory perspective, it's very difficult to hold them accountable if they're not licensed in your jurisdiction. So oftentimes if we want to enforce or investigate something that's happened, it becomes very difficult to access um, the data, do a digital audit trail in order to ultimately identify what the issue is. So those are um, some of the concerns that we're certainly um, looking to address so that, as mentioned, the benefits um, that platforms bring to the table can actually be amplified. And then I think Ritesh also touched on another point, which is really around the enablers to some of these platform scaling. So certainly in the African context, what we're seeing um, is that smartphone penetration and um, data penetration are indeed key enablers and they're not yet often in some markets they're not yet at the levels where we really see some of these platforms scaling in the ways that they need to so um, oftentimes 
um, where we do see scaling of mobile money, for instance, it's often on a feature phone um, type environment. And so until device penetration and data penetration, um, which is driven by affordability around data, um, is increased, um, we think um, there's still ways to go before we can actually see true cross-border scaling um, in the African context. So those are just some of the themes, um, Vishal, that um, I would like to share with the, with the forum. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing those, Kagi. So, so um, uh, if you have to um, give two or three pointers about how is it, uh, the, how is it going to be possible to make it safer and in the right context or fit for purpose, as you put it, for fintech solutions to be applied in geographies with the kind of financial literacy or digital literacy that um, it may not be at par with other developed countries in the West. Uh, what would be the two or three things you would ask for, especially from, say, um, the community which helps in creating more fintech uh, through investments or through creators and, uh, uh, you know, like organizations. Where, so, so, for example, if you had to ask something from Suzanne and Ritesh specifically as to what would your asks be from the point of view of creating more financial inclusion, but safe financial I'm sure, Vishal. So um, what we've done um, is we've created, um, and I think um, this is prevalent in many jurisdictions as well, we've created a sandbox um, facility that allows us to essentially take a closer look at a lot of the innovations that are being proposed. Um, and in that way, then you can get quite granular in interrogating the specific use case in order to surface what some of the risks are and then get specific advice. Because it's quite easy to be generic, but I think the, what you, we tend to find with fintechs is the use cases tend to differ and the propositions are very sophisticated. So you actually have to be quite granular and in looking at unpacking what the proposition is, how it interfaces with customers, what the customer journey looks like. From that perspective, you're then able to pinpoint. If you're going to educate your customer, given the nature of your customer journey, these are probably the key touch points where you want to inform them of um, the service you're offering. This is how you sustain um, that information flow or keep that information loop going. So. It's really about, obviously, number one, we want to promote customer education, but it has to be fit for purpose for the customer journey um, that's there. Um, I think the other thing we tend to engage on is certainly um, if you are using data, if you are using non-traditional data, what is the data ethical framework um, that governs how you make decisions of that data? So that's often also very much use case based. So we often look to um, have conversations around that in order to see ultimately how that data ethical framework shapes custom engagement. So those are the big things um, that we tend to um, to look at. Um, and then uh, other things definitely, and Ritesh touched on it as obviously advantages of his platform, but I think issues such as interoperability, issues such as business continuity, if your platform relies on external services providers, um, to what extent do you have uh, business continuity practices in place should those service providers um, fail to provide services to you? And then also lastly, just um, the extent to which customers can opt out. That's also another area we tend to um, look at um, when we're engaging with platforms in order to mitigate the risks of anti-competitive practices. And then lastly, just the cross-border um, the extent to which, um, should something occur, um, can one um, retrieve data on a cross-border basis? So those are typically the, 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 the themes that we look to unpack. But rather than approaching it generically, we typically like to do it through a sandbox mechanism that then allows us to actually um, look at the specific data um, and then, based on that, advise the fintech on how they can mitigate those risks so that the benefits um, so customers enjoy the benefits of their platform. So, Susan, in this context, uh, I would like to ask you, do you think it is going to be possible to have a, um, across the globe, will it be possible to have a unified platform of 
sending and receiving payments all together and will it ever be possible to solve these issues about um, digital literacy about securing payments from a technology perspective or uh, making sure that these platforms are not used for say financing terrorist activities not used for money laundering and so on and so forth and if yes can you share some insights about you know how you see this happening um, at at smaller levels and you believe there is a larger play at, uh, uh, possible in the next uh, few years you seem to be on mute Thank you for that question, uh, Vizal. A lot of uh, meat in that uh, uh, question uh, or questions. Um, I, I will start with the, with the regulation here because uh, everything is uh, based on the rails and then uh, you need the regulations from, uh, from uh, the territory or the holding. And here I think uh, and the, whole, uh, the whole world uh, should uh, cooperate together. So we have the same type of standards that we're building on, having uh, cross-border uh, uh, payments or whatever uh, we are working on uh, to it. So from the European uh, side, the, the harmonization across all the, the countries that is in, uh, in, in Europe uh, has been a tremendous work uh, uh, for payments, for investments, for uh, insurance, uh, for AML and, and so forth uh, to it. And if you don't have that uh, regulation in, in place, it's going to be hard to, to uh, for the AFS and, and so forth to look into is this good or isn't it? Uh, so that needs to, uh, to be in place uh, first. And then, uh, then uh, you can work on that, uh, having all those uh, regulations in place harmonized across uh, the, and we know India is uh, doing quite a lot. Text uh, coming from Europe. It's a hub that uh, the other uh, neighbor countries is looking to, to, to have this uh, so that's a good one. and the same is uh, happening eventually uh, in in Africa uh, too. We have been working with um, the African Development Bank, yeah, and they also uh, admit that uh, there needs to, to be some harmonization of uh, regulation uh, in in that continent as well, uh, along with with the rest of it. And on that sense, the uh, U.S. is lagging behind. Uh, so in that sense, I think uh, Asia can uh, uh, take a lead uh, together with uh, Europe uh, to make this there, uh, along with the. Uh, Africa uh, to it. There is a lot that can be done uh, to have uh, <laughs> financial inclusion and opening up and, and so forth. Uh, and what we see is that uh, the Western society, they have taken it uh, step by step in uh, Southeast Asia in particular, skipping generation. Africa is doing the same, skipping generation. You don't have to go uh, and do all the steps because uh, that's, uh, that's uh, history and then go to the next one. And we see so much uh, creativity uh, using uh, the smartphone. Uh, and I so agree with uh, Kagiso that uh, data is the critical. Uh, make sure it's uh, not hampered and make sure uh, that uh, you can utilize this in, in a commercial uh, way because the data is uh, like gold and, and you want to uh, to use that in a, in a in a good way and then uh, the the rural area is probably the the biggest uh, challenge uh, i think cities uh, all over the world uh, they uh, tend to have a fairly good uh, network when it comes to the internet so in that sense but the rural area is is uh, the challenge and that goes for the western society as well including uh, uh, emerging uh, markets so there are some infrastructure uh, things that needs to be in place and then the creativity from the fintech uh, can utilize that and then go much, uh, much more faster and then make sure that uh, we can uh, get real financial inclusion, not only at the account like uh, Kagiso is uh, saying, but the um, uh, uh, product and services that is beneficial uh, for the, uh, for the uh, account holder uh, to it. And it's fair and square and so forth. And then you, when once you have competition in these uh, spaces, then you, you take down the, the cost to the benefit of the consumer or, or the, uh, the businesses. So, uh, Ritesh, if, uh, 
if you come back to you and understand how uh, having an API driven interoperable uh, payment system can be applied across the world. Uh, do you think it is also possible to use the same kind of system to be able to improve supply chain financing specifically? And if yes, how? Because everything is related. Everything is data driven. Uh, uh, when it is across borders, it is also possible to understand the nature of the payments, the the payers, the payees, um, the frequency and the volume and nature of transactions. In that sense, it do you also see supply chain financing becoming easier with the development of such solutions certainly and uh, you know that's what uh, some of the uh, fintechs are doing i mean uh, uh, if, if we look at uh, the advent of digital uh, payments uh, i mean uh, we have we have uh, you know more and more information on the receivable position of uh, merchants we have more and more information you know, on uh, their, uh, you know, business turnover and things around it. So, and this all can be, you know, uh, used uh, to kind of uh, uh, explore, uh, you know, uh, lending um, um, propositions and that would actually enable uh, supply uh, kind of uh, a chain. And this is, uh, you know, what, um, I mean, we're doing this in India and, uh, you know, we are very hopeful that when we go overseas, when we create or collaborate to create uh, UPI-like solutions in international markets. I think this is something that uh, will also help in those I mean, help help those economies drive uh, you know commerce at grassroots level. Because you know, in the developing world, there is a lot of uh, you know entrepreneurial uh, talent uh, at a grassroots level. Uh, what they are looking for is uh, market access and an easy way to receive money, right? And if you get something on the ground, uh, then you are, you know, opening the doors to development. You are opening the doors to, you know, driving parity in income, and you are, uh, you know, creating employment opportunities. So, a solution like UPI, API-driven, you know, driving inclusion can really, really, uh, you know, change the game. And uh, that's what we are looking at, uh, you know, uh, when we reach out to. Um, uh, partners or prospective partners globally that's our uh, you know proposition that uh, this is not only to drive uh, inclusion this is also to you know uh, generate uh, the the employment support fintech incubation and then things around it and uh, uh, do you think uh, uh, when we talk about inclusion is it only about more number of people coming on to a technology network for making payments or does it also help in improving other parameters of inclusion such as uh, poverty uh, gender inclusion and so on and so forth can you can you share some examples you've you've actually been at the heart of taking the upi across indian borders and especially in countries where major impact can be done if, if there is some story that you could share with us on how you see this really making an impact it so uh, you know uh, i think a platform like upi can deliver a 360 degree you know uh, government's agenda and uh, what a government is interested is in like one is financial inclusion we all talk about then there is also direct citizen welfare that they are looking at they're also looking at cash displacement they're also looking at employment generation a program like upi can deliver all this even gender uh, you know inclusion and things around it and i'll give an example uh, uh, in my uh, previous assignment uh, in uh, Middle East, I, I used to see that a lot of women who are, you know, not full-time, uh, you know, business owners, but part-time business owners, they would go to platform like Facebook and Instagram and sell and, but they will struggle to collect money. I mean, because there was, there's nothing like UPI there, but here, I mean, if you see uh, people can, uh, women from their homes can, you know, uh, uh, solicit their products or solutions, whatever they cook. It, like handicraft or you know um, things like pickle or something they can retail it on their side and you know through upi ids they can collect money so that's the power of upi and uh, you know if you walk in any city or village in india you see qr code hanging outside that's you know truly uh, you know transformational and that's what you know it keeps us uh, you know motivated and uh, that's i think the magic that upi as an ecosystem has created here in india i i completely agree i think the uh, the hanging QR codes are a testament to be able to use uh, your phone to be able to transact anywhere and not have the risk of uh, 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 any theft. You know, if you're if you're in a remote place or anything of that sort. And I feel this is particularly more relevant in the um, places where there is a lower level of uh, literacy or lower GDPs in India. So. Uh, so can you help us understand over, over the last 
few years since the time fintech has its boom and uh, african region is always a beneficiary of investments and technology because uh, everyone wants to capture that market because it is so fresh right um, can you help us understand uh, apart from just having users use mobile phone for making payments what is the real impact that uh, a beneficiary region can make from more financial solutions and not just products more financial solutions coming from across the border you're on mute yeah sorry just unmuting so i think yeah that's a really great question so i think the low hanging fruit has definitely been around payments but what we're starting to see is use cases that are looking beyond um payments um and really this is to address financial inclusion in a deeper way because besides just the ability to transact transfer funds and store your value certainly there's other needs that are unaddressed so um so what we're starting to see is mobile money um apps or super apps starting to come in come to fruition where they're really looking to address um um how you insure um well the insurance need essentially they're looking to lend on an alternative basis um using data and also um they're looking to drive um or democratize access to investment which has typically um been really accessed only by sophisticated investors so that's the solutions that we're starting to see and they're all um really uh integrated into a platform either a super app or um a mobile money solution and the telcos actually are at the forefront of this so typically um for consumers as a hook what they typically provide is some means to um to drive e-commerce and what this then is meant to achieve is that consumers are then meant to keep their funds within the the app or the mobile money environment um and then through those transactions they're then looking to help them insure um some of those goods um and then on the chain side on the other side of the platform that's where you start to see supply chain or working capital finance coming to 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 fruition so they get the data around how, how what volumes they're doing what their working capital is looking like and then based on that that data they then able to extend um solutions um lending solutions to to those particular um merchants or small and medium enterprises and this tends to be a gap in the market at the moment so um banks typically don't have the appetite to actually lend to small and medium enterprises and merchants often because they do not have the financial information to actually lend them however because the platforms can actually see the volumes in real time that some of these merchants are actually uh, are actually doing they're able to then base um their lending off of this data so we're starting to see a lot more use cases um coming coming to be um which is great because ultimately i think it it allows us to get a lot more deeper in our efforts to um to not only address the non-banked but also to address the underbanked so i think that's what we're starting to see and um i think um from that perspective we're only going to see more um more of that innovation coming to be thank you so much for that uh, i think uh, excellent perspectives being shared what i take away um you know uh, is that uh, we just about begun in using uh, technology when it comes to creating a unified um, payments kind of a world in that sense right and it can only be possible through technology so while uh, a lot depends on regulators to be able to uh, develop frameworks that allow different countries to interact and make uh, transactions seamless using technology and make faster payments faster payments would mean more assurance on trade uh, it would mean lower costs of transactions and it would ha- have a very high level of insuredness a short level of uh, uh, trade to be carried out i think the same will also be true for for a consumers perspective we uh, still see so many consumers and you know being in india who while appreciating the fact that it is very easy to be able to make payments using your mobile phone for anything everything that you want to do right from buying groceries to be able to settle hospital bills or you know even make payments to a counterparty for large financial transactions because it is 
is fast at at any point of time is increasing but there is always a fear and and the fear is because of the security so i believe that security uh, regulations and go hand in hand with the development of the solutions uh, to be able to create a very secured and and faster adaptability at the same time i think it is also important for incumbents uh, the people who are developing these payment solutions and using technology to be able to build financial products to ensure that there is enough amount of digital and technical uh, digital and financial literacy amongst people so that they feel secure themselves that i believe is um, an investment that the business community needs to make to be able to upskill and bring up the level of literacy with respect to technology and finance uh, you know with the people uh, as common people have to use especially consumers in that sense um with that i would just like to summarize and you know then uh, with each one i think as as personally i believe that it is an extremely important turn in in our uh, history because this is where we are at the brink of truly addressing poverty inclusion and economic growth three very important factors three very important sdgs in that sense so from the point of view of uh, helping different companies develop the solutions i am taking away some very very important points with a commitment to the business world and to regulators that we will ensure that there is a safer and faster more seamless adoption of financial uh, uh, technology to be used from an inclusion perspective um ritesh if you want to share some last words and then you know we could go to the rest as well Uh, thanks vishal uh, no i mean uh, i would like to uh, you know close by saying that uh, you know with uh, at npci international you know we are uh, all uh, you know set and uh, we are uh, ready for collaboration internationally to uh, you know deliver uh, what we have delivered in india operating at great scale uh, with the complete interoperability uh, using open source technology and uh, we are uh, Uh, you know very excited about this and we look forward to you know repeating this feat uh, in other markets thank you and and suzan from uh, any last few words from you yeah i think uh, open bank will be a trigger for uh, dig- digitalization going forward so you can take down the uh, cost and of course uh, have the rails uh, and i believe that the uh, sme side uh, which is very underserved uh, will uh, bam bam and like eritesh was uh, talking about earlier uh, once you have the digitalization with the fintechs uh, you grow the gdp and the economy and so forth uh, to it um sustainability and financial inclusion goes hand in hand uh, so i will uh, end with that thank you thank you and and kaviso uh, any uh, last final words Yeah so from our side I think as regulators we certainly welcome um, many of these financial innovations so much so that we've realized that the pace at which these innovations are hitting the market has required us to move from being reactive to much more proactive and collaborative um and that's how we then um rapidly promote some of the benefits while rapidly also mitigating some of the risks and this can happen quickly so that we don't end up stifling innovation so certainly from our perspective um that that that's the the main um, thesis of how we engage and we recognize also that it's an ecosystem approach that's required um so it's there's several players involved and i think ultimately for us also is making sure that we direct the from especially from a policy perspective we direct um the financial innovators towards solving and addressing real concerns um that consumers and enterprises are facing because i think um if that is their true north i think that's where um you start to see um jurisdictions benefiting um and you see a lot of the leapfrogging that suzanne was talking about i completely agree and uh, i think this has been a very very uh, insightful session thank you for sharing so many great points ritesh uh, and also personally very proud of of uh, uh, upi in that sense thank you suzan and thank you kagiso uh, for joining this and i really enjoyed talking to you all uh, over to jivisha thank you thank you, you so much those are some great insights in developing fintech solutions across boundaries 
thank you mr vishal arula from alvarez and martin for moderating this discussion so well i would also like to thank our panelists mr ritesh shukla npci international payments limited mr kagiso motibi from F financial conduct authority and ms susan hanestad from fintech mundi for taking time out to join us today we hope you all enjoyed being a part of the session we would also like to thank our supported by partners central bank of kenya institutional partners reserve bank innovation hub the world bank uncdf ladies and gentlemen thanks for joining us at global fintech fest please stay tuned for the next session thank you